And companies were still looking at almost like a superficial level of progress sometimes. It's more about output versus outcome. There needs to be a deeper level of trust we're building out in these orgs where it's a place where we can fail. Do people want this? Should we be working on this? Will it be profitable? Can we do this? Wasting time, wasting money, wasting creative capacity and all of this energy and enthusiasm that people have. In a big company, you know, sometimes we just want people to succeed. We, we don't want things to fail. I'm really trying to help solve that problem of, hey, what's your risk about this idea? Like, community that really says we have to inspect and adapt and learn and run in iterations, and then we apply a giant waterfall process to a transformation. <laughs> you need to have uh, some ideas, <laughs> one, ideas to work with, a pipeline. You need to have the teams, you know, people assembled around these ideas. You need to have the funding. You need to have some kind of process to, to work through it. Wow. If we just tested that a little bit more, we wouldn't have spent millions of dollars on, on, on this thing that kind of flopped. Welcome, everyone, to our next episode of the Agile Insights Conversations. I'm super happy to have David Bled with me today. He is the author of Testing Business Idea, or one of the co-authors with Alex Osterwalder together. And David and I will be talking about how to apply these tools and techniques that he has carefully curated in this book in larger organizations, because I believe in startups, it's mostly straightforward, but we'll also talk about that. Before we get there, David, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I'm super happy that you're here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Now, David, as some of our um, listeners and viewers might not know who you are, um, I briefly mentioned that you are the co-author or the author of the uh, Testing Business Ideas. I would love to give you the stage to briefly introduce yourself, and then we dive right into the conversation. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm based out here in Northern California. I am... Uh... I would say a problem solver at heart. So just very curious. And so it kind of having bounced around startups that some were successful, some weren't, it really drew me to this idea of how do we help companies from maybe there's a problem to be solved or an idea in the back of my mind to product market fit? Like, how do I turn that into action? And so over the years, I just started getting more and more passionate about that space. And so I made the switch to coaching and consulting around 2010, 2011 or so and moved to the Bay Area and in uh, Silicon Valley and just really started digging into, you know, working with large companies, helping them do that, but also helping some of the startups and VCs in the Valley. And yeah, fast forward till today and, and I'm still still doing this work. It's really, it's very satisfying for me. I can really connect to what you said, like being a problem solver, right? Seeing that there is a problem and trying to use all the experiences that you have, the analytical power that you have to solve that problem. So I relate well to that. Now, a few years back, um, when was the book published, Testing Business Ideas? And it was, I think, pre-pandemic, right? It was, yeah, right before the pandemic. So right it was 2019, around November. So here in the United yeah. States, I remember flying to London and with Alex and team uh, at Strategizer in Shoreditch doing kind of our first combo masterclass where it was two days of kind of invincible company and, and, and some Alex content. And there was two days behind that of, of testing business ideas content. And uh, on the flight back, everything started getting shut down. So I come into SFO, uh, it was very much like go to your homes and you know shut the doors. <laughs> so it was really a weird time to launch a book because I had just started the book tour, just started the promotion and then everything kind of kind of closed down. Yeah, but I think the book did still quite well, uh, especially looking at the bestseller list on Amazon. And I, I, re I understand why, because it's a great book. Now, walk me through, why did you write this book? You mentioned earlier, you are a problem solver. You've been working with organizations, startups, larger corporations, VCs. But why did you decide to write this particular book? It, it was somewhat uh, Alex convincing me in a way. You know, the conversation started with Alex saying, Hey, you should write a book because <laughs> because we've been partnering and I've been doing a lot of coaching and everything around, you know, how do you experiment? How do you map your risk and all that? And it was really interesting. At first, I was like, well, yeah, you don't have to convince me. I mean, it was it was I'd already tried to write books in the past and I have a bunch of Dropbox folders full of half finished books, you know, but I felt to finish one, it would really have to solve for like a job for the reader, you know, give them some kind of superpower. Otherwise, it's just such a big endeavor. It's really hard to drive to completion. And so the conversation kind of went back and forth and he was very generous uh, with his time. You know, eventually he was uh, brought on as a co-author for the book and, and really leveraged a lot of his strategic thinking around it. But it was basically around this need of, 
we keep coaching teams that can do interviews, surveys, maybe a landing page, and then they kind of just build the whole thing. And so there were so many different options available to reduce risk. And I thought, wow, I don't scale well by myself. You know, I still do a lot of coaching and workshops, but could I get that in print in some way? And I have to say my editor at Wiley, the one of the best things he ever said to me was just write the book like you're coaching a team. And, and that's really what clicked for me. And so I was like, oh, I could do that. And so that's when I started, you know, really seeing that what this could be. Uh, but I never dreamed it'd be this popular. It's really cool to see um, people using it and having it on their desk. I can imagine. I can imagine. I'm in the middle of or at the beginning of writing a, a book. Um, I've been hesitant with that for a long time. And you know what? It was Alex who convinced me to do it. So <laughs> I can totally relate to that. He is very convincing. Now, uh, you mentioned that you wanted this book to solve a specific problem. And you mentioned also the topic of risk and uncertainty. Now, what, what, what was it that you saw in most organizations happening that you were like, I need to write this because there is this big problem. What, what, what was that problem? Well, it's, it's kind of wasting your time building something that nobody wants, you know, and I think every org or the teams, even we can think about, we were on in the past or organizations we were in, you know, there are these failures that are, it's like, wow, if we just tested that a little bit more, we wouldn't have spent millions of dollars on, on, on this thing that kind of flopped. And so that's, that's what really draws me to it is I think, you think about, you know, the rise in technology and AI and all this stuff that's going on in our world right now. You think about just the time we spend as people and how limited that is. Like, why waste your time nights and weekends uh, building stuff that nobody cares about? And so I'm, I'm really trying to help solve that problem of, hey, what's your risk about this idea? How we go test that out sooner versus later and then make a more informed investment decision based on kind of evidence and kind of calibrating our confidence to that. And so... It's really about just helping prevent companies from from wasting money more than anything else. And I think we can all think about a team we've been on <laughs> that, that wasted a lot of money. So this this really wasting time and money is really kind of what I'm drawn to is like helping people avoid that. Wasting time, wasting money, we're wasting creative capacity and all of this energy and and enthusiasm that people have. We, I mean, we've all been there now. In the world of startups, there are like different numbers out there, right? Nine out of 10 startups or eight out of 10 startups, depending on who you ask. But a vast majority of startups fail because of not having product market and ultimately not having a business model fit. I uh, just yesterday or the day before, I read about Zoom's pizza that raised a lot of money, but now closed the doors. I think they spent $400 million and now Investors don't get anything and employees don't get anything, et cetera. But in corporations, um, I haven't seen a study where, where we get a similar number, like what percentage of initiatives within larger organizations fail? I have a feeling that it's a lot, but do you have something more precise? I don't think corporations want to talk about that, you know, publicly. And so I'm always trying to convince my clients, get out there and talk about this new stuff you're doing. And get people excited about it and how you're testing your way through it. And it's always been kind of nudging them to get out and, and, and really talk about it. Cause they don't, they don't prioritize that, you know, they prioritize all these internal factors and everything. And, and I don't know if we'll ever really get to that number. Um, but I have to say in corporations, it's more likely that that idea is going to limp along forever and never be successful, but never really fail than in the startups because startups have that those constraints in your runway and it's pretty clearly defined you need to find fit before you run out of runway in a big company you know sometimes we just want people to succeed we, we don't want things to fail we might fund things that we shouldn't we keep enough resources to just keep it limping along when we should really just you know <laughs> say okay that's that didn't work Let, let's park that or shelve it or kill it and move on and so i find even if we had those numbers in companies you'd probably see you know, more, more ideas just limping along forever than actually being like deemed as, as failures. Yeah. I mean, I mean, a failure could be if, if you actually stop working on it, but it could also be that idea not reaching what you initially envisioned, right? So especially in larger corporations, usually they have some kind of business case around it, right? Some kind of return on invest calculation that they do before they even get the funding. And uh, I agree with you. I think it's it's due to the fact that most organizations don't want to talk to, about it in the public, but even internally, they want they don't want to admit that the idea that they had that they heavily funded did not reach the the, the things that were that they were looking for. 
Now, you mentioned constraints within startups. And before we go back to these larger organizations, these constraints are mostly like financial constraints, sometimes talent constraints, etc. Do you believe that it would be beneficial for larger organizations to have these constraints? I think our creativity is directly tied to the constraints, you know, and, and how we're incentivized to test. You know, if you have an infinite runway and an infinite amount of funding, even if it's not enough, but it's enough to keep going, then you're not really incentivized to test your way through that. You know, uh, if there's no, there's no incentive to do so, it's more about, well, I can keep, I can keep working and releasing features and, and, and working on this forever. Right. Um, but I think in a startup, I personally lived this, right. We, we had to find, you know, a completely different segment. Like the first startup I joined, we thought we were business to consumer. We ended up being a business to business startup before we were acquired. So it, it was like born out of that constraint of we're going to have to pack up all our stuff and go home if we can't find, you know, an addressable market for what this thing we've built. And so I don't see that a lot inside corporations. Sometimes we don't have that sense of urgency or that sense of, you know, the constraints within how we, how we operate. It's more about you know, it, it can, it, we can be busy, you know, we can appear busy on it for a long time and therefore it'll keep living. So I, I do think some constraints would, would be helpful. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with that. I think that sense of urgency or the fear of having to pack up your stuff and go home and uh, look for your paycheck somewhere else that, that could actually uh, drive more creativity and the need to find those things. Now in that book, you cover I don't know, it feels like hundreds of experiments that one can do to reduce um, uncertainty and risk. Have you ever counted how many methods and ideas you brought up in that book? Well, I think officially there's around 44, but I think um, unofficially there's other things I've hinted at in there. And there's certainly many more than I've listed. We just had to go to print at some point. But I really <laughs> tried to narrow in on the stuff that I'd personally seen or been around over the years. And I tried not to go too heavily into theory land of here's theoretically how an experiment, experiment could work. Uh, my only my only complaint is that I wish, you know, my companies would have been more willing to talk about what they're working on because I could have put more studies in there. So I think if we do another edition, um, I'll definitely chalk it full of more case studies of people working this way. But um, yeah, I tried to make it not just a list, but how do you select? I think that's what's Absolutely. really helpful in that book is how do you select an experiment? Because we got kind of a list of stuff everywhere, but I think where we get hung up is what do we choose based on where we are? I think that's where it's really hard. Yeah. I wouldn't underestimate the the um, the value of the list itself, because especially when I, I mean, I teach a lot of courses for product owners, product managers. I work with leaders and they, in many cases, have no clue what kind of experiments exist. So the list itself, I believe, is valuable. And as I mentioned, it it feels like 100 you, or, or even more. You mentioned it's 44. But of course, yes, um, they're also showing the people, as you mentioned, uh, uh, trying to write the book in a way as you're coaching them and um, showing them which experiment fits in which context. That was that was super valuable to me as well. Now, let's go to this actual topic, which is when we look at larger organization lacking some of those constraints that you mentioned earlier, other than lacking those constraints, why do you think most organizations fail to implement many of these experiments to reduce the risk of developing a product that nobody wants. I, I think we're still in, 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 in companies, we're still looking at almost like a superficial level of progress. Sometimes um, it's more about output versus outcome. And I think you're pretty mm -hmm. familiar with that framing and, you know, it's measured like, are we staying busy? Are we delivering things on time, on budget and all that on scope? And I think it's much harder to say, are we measuring some kind of outcome or impact and are we moving the needle in some way in behavior change or generating more revenue in certain specific ways? And I, I think um, when you think about trust inside organizations, it's like, well, did you, you said you're going to deliver something. Did you deliver it? Okay. Therefore I trust you, but there needs to be a deeper level of trust we're building out in these orgs where it's, it's a place where we can fail, you know, it, we can try different things and, 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 and I feel like that's still not the norm. It's very much, I don't want to throw it back to the industrial era, but it, it still feels like a lot of the modern companies I work with are kind of structured off the industrial era where everything's broken down into projects and then tasks and then farmed out in a way where it's like my function, I'm doing this specific task over and over again. And I just don't think knowledge work, it, it doesn't make sense to go about it in that fashion. So I feel like we've, the pandemic helped us break that constraint a little bit, 
But I think we need to really take a look at how we structure our orgs and, and the cultures we're building, because I feel it's almost, it's almost feels like factories sometimes still, even if we're developing software and other things, it feels like projects, tasks, and run things at projects, and we blow up the project and create another project. It's, it's really interesting to see how, how much that's lingered <laughs> over, over, the, over the last like 100 years even. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree with you. And you brought up these two terms, output and outcome. If you think about the industrial area, they're actually completely tied to each other, right? If you know what you're building, let's say you want to build this Ford Model T, right? Sorry, prime example for the industrial area. I mean, era, the more cars you build, the more outcome you have, right? That's output and outcome connected to each other. Now, if you're doing new stuff, if you're building a new product, be it software or whatever, it could also be a new type of car, output does not necessarily equal outcome. Of course, you don't have any outcome without any output, but it's not like the more output I have, the more outcome I have. And I think one of the things that I see in most organizations is that also the leadership team in those organizations hasn't made that connection yet. They are not aware of the fact that it's not about creating more output. And it's, if we especially look at like how many organizations in, implement agile ways of working, they're like, no, no, just keep on velocity, 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 but you're not getting the outcomes. And I see that happening in, in uh, organizations that are strong in retail and now want to build, for example, e-commerce solutions, so software, et cetera, but they fail to understand that there's a difference between that and store operations or being good on purchasing stuff. So I agree with you. This industrial era mindset is um, is still very, very strong. Another point you mentioned is uh, trust, right? That there is this lack of trust between maybe management and teams. At least that's how I interpreted it. When when you see that, where do you where do you start or how do you start working on that? Yeah, I mean, it takes time. You don't you don't change the culture of a company overnight. And so this idea of, you know, if you want to build a culture of experimentation, well, step one, we, we can't treat this kind of almost holdover from the industrial era level of thinking and just apply it to experimentation. And, and I feel, you know, I already see it happening, right? It's like, how many experiments are we running? What's the number of experiments? What's our experiment velocity? Oh, that term just makes me, me cringe a little bit, you know? Um, but <laughs> but um, it's a good one. Yeah. And, and then it's, it's, it's uh, measuring, you know, how many experiments we're, we're not really the point isn't running more experiments, it's de-risking what you're working on. It's reducing the uncertainty in it. And so the number of experiments doesn't directly relate to that. You know, it's about strength mm -hmm. of evidence, about, you know, tying it back to your riskiest assumptions and all that. And so I do see this trend, and this happened with design thinking, this happened with lean startup, it's happened with agile, it, is we take this sort of industrial era thinking and we just start apply it to the new thing, you know? It's like, uh, well, there's gonna be handoffs, you know? I think my favorite one was agile, is like, oh, we have a, you know, uh, requirement sprint and then a <laughs> development sprint and then a testing sprint. And you're like, what are you doing? This is just waterfall condensed, right? And the same way with Lean Startup is like we have a build phase and then a measure phase and then a learn phase. I'm like, no, these aren't phases, right? Same thing with design thinking. It's like, oh, we're done with the empathy phase. It's like, no, empathy is not a phase, you know? And so I think some element is just breaking that dynamic of can we create an environment where we have a goal and we're given uh, the space to sort of show how we're making progress towards that goal or not and as and i don't think that's quite common yet it, we think about accountability and so accountability is more like i'm holding you accountable to to delivering this feature on this date or, or hitting this milestone but it's not necessarily a team's giving an account of how they're learning about reaching a goal or de-risking something and so i think um and i mentioned this in a book as far as like team design and then the environment the team res, you know resides within I do think the environment work is the work of leaders. You know, your environment's going and your culture's going to occur whether you pay attention to it or not. And so at least be top of mind about, look, we say we have these principles. Are we living up to these in some way? What are our, our practices in relation to that? And how do we create an environment where teams are safe enough or feel safe enough to give an account of, hey, that idea we thought might have been a really good idea. It actually isn't because of X, Y, and Z. I, I still see, you know, leaders need to be working on that nonstop. Um, because that's that's their job as leaders is to create that environment where working like this can can occur. Yeah. Now, what I hear um, you saying, David, and correct me if I, if I'm wrong, is um, similar to many of the techniques that came up, right? Design thinking, you mentioned that lean startup, agile. 
that even the stuff within testing business ideas, right, this toolkit of experimentation could, um, if you apply the industrial era mindset to it, um, result in teams not necessarily being very effective in terms of how they build products, right? If they measure the number of experiments, but not the validity of those experiments and to what extent they're actually reducing the risk, they're not getting to the goal that you and I probably believe that, that they should be getting to. Now, how do you help um, these, these leaders, right, that ultimately are in charge of the environment, of that safe environment to create that trust? How do you start your work with those leaders? Because that's also the area or, or the level within organizations that I get to work with most, right, helping them create the environment so that the product teams can actually build great products and reduce the risk as they go. Yeah, I have some different methods that I, I rely on back from, you know, when I did a bit of org transformation work. Um, but it really comes down to, are, are, do they have a goal? Are they really aligned on a goal they're trying to achieve? You know, and then from that, it's, okay, well, what kind of capabilities would we need to reach that goal inside the company? And some may be completely new, some might be um, just not very mature. And then saying, what kind of things, like tasks do we need to do to feed into those capabilities that feed into that goal? And so what ends up happening is you can have like this little map, right? And and basically, for if you want to end up, you know, kind of reducing risk or, or getting better at testing business ideas in general, you know, there's some components to that. You, you need to have uh, some ideas, <laughs> one, ideas to work with, a pipeline, right? Uh, you need to have um, the teams, you know, people assembled around these ideas. You need to have the funding, right? And you need to have some kind of process to, to work through it. And so... I, not that we do it all at once, but I try to at least lay it out in a way where we say, look, you know, here's some things you're good at. Here's some things you're not so great at. How do we start implementing some of this? How do we start building this capability inside your company? Because I have to say, I've seen companies out here in Silicon Valley spend two or three years on this kind of work and then feel as if, oh, the company is just going to magically work this way. And then they stop and they just revert back to what they were doing before. And so it really, it really, um, it requires some attention and focus from leadership and repetition, maybe even more so than they're willing to do or want to do mm -hmm. of repeating this message of how do we build this out capability and keep this top of mind? Cause I think it's really easy to revert back to, you know, this entrenched way of working for a long time, which is more, you know, industrial era sort of style. Yeah. So basically build this continuous discovery mindset as Teresa Torres refers to, right? And as you mentioned, right, in, in design thinking, empathy, em empathize is not a face. It's something that you continuously do. <clears throat> now, let's get into some of the some of the tools. We were talking that we were saying that startups for them very naturally, right? It, all of those experiments or some of those experiments, depending on the context that they're in, could fit. Now, when we look at large corporations, other than the lack of constraints and leadership playing a huge role, where do you see that the ideas that you brought up in your book? could really help? And where do you see that some of those things cannot really work because those organizations are different than startups? And maybe you don't, you say, no, no, they can always work independent from startup or big corporation. I think the principles work regardless of what industry I'm in, hardware, software, services, uh, startup, mid-sized company, big company. I think the principles, because almost like the principles of scientific method, right? Mm -hmm. This, this thing would have to be true. We don't know if it's true. Can we go test and, and find out and then repeat that? So I think at a principle level, you know, scientific method works. Uh, I, I don't really have a lot of things to, to, to push back against on scientific method. Mm -hmm. However, um, the practices do look a bit different because, you know, when you're a startup, your brand, nobody cares. I mean, if you think of all these like really successful companies, they started off usually some other quirky brand. You look at DoorDash, right? DoorDash started off as Palo Alto delivery service. You know, that wasn't going to <laughs> resonate to a, a global audience, right? Or a national audience. And so uh, Ring, you know, Ring started off as a different name. Like a lot of these companies started off as something kind of quirky, but they solved the real problem and they were able to get traction and build up to a point where they could rebrand, you know? But I'm working with companies that the brand is over 100 years old. And so they're just very nervous about doing anything that's going to damage their brand. And so it's a lot of my coaching is about, well, how do we do this without damaging your brand? You know, can we do a labs brand or a project brand or something off brand or lightly brand? Like, can we do something where we're not leading with the brand? And it <clears throat> brings down all this anxiety and everything <clears throat> about 
the brand itself being damaged. And so I think um, one of the things that I've been more mindful of in my time working with big companies is how do I help them navigate that and apply these practices and not damage their brand, but still find out, is this something worth investing in? And mm-hmm. so um, I, I'm finding a lot of fun in that area because it, it kind of opens up some more options to them. Whereas I always look for these conversation stoppers, which are, we can't do that here because that would damage the brand or we can't do here because legal won't let us. And I, I really try to navigate that a bit more with these big clients to say, well, can we challenge that a bit, you know, because this might not be true in this instance if we have executives saying, look, we want to try something different. So uh, I would say overall, the biggest thing I see is brand. Uh, that, that's probably the biggest difference I see between startups and big companies. Yeah. So brand or, or reputation damage. Now, in, in that specific case, because I've come across this um, a lot, is it mostly that these organizations then set up a new brand? under which they run their experiments? Or what do you see mostly? What do you advise them to do mostly? Yeah, sometimes they do. I've noticed a lot of labs brands or project brands for some of my clients. And then you'll see a landing page and it'll be be leading with this kind of quirky new brand you never heard of. But then underneath somewhere, it'll say powered by and it'll have the big company. Uh, Some of the crowdfunding I've seen on Indiegogo has been, you know, whatever this labs thing, but then it's like powered by and then big company. And so they're even do crowdfunding that way now. So um, another way you could do is just have like a wholly owned subsidiary. And it's kind of what GE did with um, first build, right? You have a micro factory in, 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 in Kentucky where you're essentially cranking out, you know, these ice makers and things like that. It's packed, it's backed by GE appliances. Um, but it looks like its own thing. Right. And so there are different levels to that. Um, but I have to say in my experience, I find it very difficult. There's some companies that have done this like Google or now alphabet has done this and, and maybe to an extent with Facebook or meta and, and the new product stuff they're doing, but it's hard to spin ideas out from underneath the brand as separate like entities, because then you talk about IP and all that stuff gets tied up into it. So, um, I like starting with something not that heavy of a lift. So it's more about like a labs brand or a project brand. And then still tie it to your, your parent brand, but you're not leading with your logo front and center of your brand. You know, you're leading with the lab's name or whatever. And then you can test in a way that's kind of more focused on, hey, am I solving a real problem or are people coming this just because it has my logo on it of this company? Because um, we don't really want all that attention or noise right away. Usually in our testing, we want to keep it small. And so the lab's brand, project brand stuff tends to work out pretty well in our advantage in that regard. Yeah. Okay. So it, it seems to be like a good good balance in there. Now, other than this brand or reputation damage risk that organizations might might face, what, what else do you see that would be a major uh, distinction or uh, difference between these corporations and startups that want to apply the ideas and testing business ideas? Yeah, probably legal and to an extent and, and regulatory. Um, I don't want to say all startups need to be a little bit illegal, but it's certainly a trend of we're going to push the envelope when it comes to what we can do. You know, uh, it's, are we going to do autonomous cars? Are we going to do uh, things that maybe from a legality point of view are like, hmm, is that a gray area? Can I do that in this region or whatever? Like startups are a little more risk. They, they take bigger risks there. Whereas a big company, it's like, oh, we have to consult the legal team. And so what I've been doing with big companies is I, I really bring legal early into the conversation of what is, what does the law look like? And if we're under certain regulations to report finance a certain way, like, what are those rules and regulations? Like, get somebody in the room that knows versus just having the team be scared about it and be worried about it. And just, it's almost like there's a wall that they perceive to be there or maybe they, they hit in the past and they don't even want to come up to that wall again. They don't even want to test that wall because they've either been reprimanded or they just felt as if they don't want to go up against, you know, and, and be told no again. And so sometimes that wall is no longer there but they're not aware of it. And so they almost like self-censor some of their ideas and what what's possible. So I really like inviting in legal and regulatory and governance and compliance and people early and say, here's our intent. Like, here's what we're trying to do. And what are, what, what is like, what kind of sandbox do we play in when we do this? And quite often that ends up being a much bigger sandbox than the teams imagine because they have in their, in their own minds created a walls that they cannot, um, breakthrough. And I find that's that level of kind of thinking really permeates big business. And so, so much of me is getting the right people together to have a 
conversation early on of whether or not that it that is is that really a a wall that we're going to hit or not and it's really i've i've lost count of the times where like um here, here in the united states we have like sarbanes oxley and everything because of the dot com bubble and all Here's that well. and, and so uh people are like oh we can't do that because that would like that's not the socks control won't let us and it's just like okay who wrote that well well, this, well someone over here knows about what that is and it's like okay can you bring that person over and let's talk to them and then and they'll be like no no that's not <laughs> that's not the way it works or you'll have somebody saying well the fda won't let us do that and then you get legal fda consultant in the room and he's like no no that's not you can do it through this and, and that's really big in medical and biotech companies i work yeah. with so it's just so much about these perceived walls and, and, that we have and and helping the team understand like, do, are these walls really in place for us? <laughs> because sometimes they're not. And it's really, it's, it's almost like refreshing to see their eyes light up and be like, oh, we can actually do some things. And yeah, I find that happens quite a bit in big companies. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. I had one med tech client where there was one person saying, no, 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 FDA wants us to work in a waterfall way. I'm like, uh, I would challenge us. I don't know it, but I would challenge it. So let's, let's talk to the, the guys that are familiar with that. And then they came in, they're like, no, that has so far been our interpretation. But what FDA wants is not us following a certain process, just provide them certain outcomes, right? And we can do that in, in another way. So what I feel is, A, by bringing in those people, legal, regulatory, et cetera, you can really test how big your sandbox is. And even what with what they say, you can even challenge that. Because sometimes they're also only interpreting what some stakeholder from the outside wants. And based on understanding what your intention is today, they might go and reinterpret those rules and regulations. And then suddenly your sandbox ends up being much bigger. Now, what I was think thinking of when, when you were speaking, um, David, is right, the sandbox that you're playing it in, in initially, right? That's also an assumption that you have. Assumption by definition means you have certain levels of uncertainty. And by involving that stakeholder early, internal or external, you're doing risk reduction. So you're, un you're basically using the same techniques as laid out in your book, right, to evaluate for the team what is the box that we're playing in and how can it be increased. Now, do you have other... Um, Area. So we talked about brand and uh, reputation damage. We talked about legal and regula regulatory, especially in highly regulated environments like medical de technologies and, and pharma. What else do you see being a major difference between, and it could also be a positive difference between startups and larger corporations? Well, I think there's two that come to mind. Um, one, one is in incentives. Uh, so, so what are the incentives for me to work this way in a bigger company? Uh, the upside in the startup is pretty clear. It's very risky. Like nine times out of 10, it'll, your, your startup's going to fail. I think personally, I've been a part of three and one was successful and two weren't. So that's probably even, you know, better than nine out of 10 uh, odds. But when you think about, well, why would I work this way inside of a company? Why would I bring my best ideas to this company? I feel like we start to get at the, the underlying issues of working this way at big companies because people are often worried about bringing their best ideas into big companies. Uh, what happens if I create millions and millions of dollars for this company? I still collect the same paycheck. Um, I don't really see an upside in that. Uh, whereas if I left and pursued this idea at my own company, it might fail, but there might also be a really big payday for me. And so I think we get to the underlying, like what's motivating people to work this way. And at startups, it's much more clear. There's a, there's a big upside to change the world or whatever your vision of your startup looks like. But at a big company, I find it's not always that clear. And so I do have some clients that play with that, right? They'll, they'll give people, you know, there's like, we'll pay this salary and here's the amount of upside you get in the business and there's some kind of rev share and things. But I still think that's pretty, um, that's not necessary. It's an outlier. I don't think that's common yet. And so if we get incentives, I think that's one thing that I view inside bigger companies. It's almost like we're not willing to talk about it. We're, we're willing to talk about here are all the processes and techniques and tools we use and blah, blah, blah. But when it comes down to, okay, well, what's in it for me? Uh, what's the upside in it if I create tens of millions of dollars of revenue for you? <laughs> and, and it's almost, there's this, it's crickets. It's almost like, well, the company will be more successful. It's like, okay, but what's that? <laughs> you know, so I do think there's something, I don't know if you see that with your clients, but I, I do see that as this underlying thing we're just not really willing to talk about <laughs> very often. 
No, you know why? Because, uh, I mean, what should be motivating for the people is just having autonomy, mastery and purpose, according to Daniel Pink. <laughs> if you take the issue of money on the, off the table, there's no more issue. I think there's a lot of truth to that, right? I believe all three things are important, but I agree with you. The financial upside could be a significant incentive for people to bring their best ideas to the organizations. And before you, before you said this, I was wondering, like, do any organizations deal with that topic? Because to my knowledge and the co companies that I have seen, none of them have any program in there so that their internal, like their, their intrapreneurs would be incentivized to A, bring their best ideas and B, work their sorry asses off to make those ideas successful because there is just no financial upside. I mean, it could be the next promotion, but that's like 10, maybe 15, 20% salary raise. But the big payday, as you can see it in some startups, I haven't seen that happen at any of these larger organizations. Yeah, I, I think it's it's starting to happen. The conversation is starting to happen, at least. Um, you know, I think some of these, especially if you have a wholly owned subsidiary, you maybe have a little more freedom in what you can do for compensation. I know publicly traded companies, sometimes I've seen and heard of conversations where people are like, don't pay us a salary, just let us get the upside of this business we're creating. And then he makes it all the way up to the board level of that company. And the board's like, no, nah, we're not going to improve that, you know? So I, I do think there are some, um, th there's some challenges there, but I think, you know, it, so money isn't the driver for everybody. Right. But uh, some, some others, it, it feels as if, you know, they want ownership of the thing. So if I go test out this new idea, I want to be able to take it forward and own it and build a team around it. And, and so there is some prestige in that of I've created a multi-million dollar business inside of a company. Even if you're making roughly the same salary, you do have this like pride that you've done so and you have a team to manage and you can grow professionally that way. So I do think that happens sometimes as well. But I think if, if we keep coming back to what's the underpinning of why we aren't working this way as often as we can inside corporations, like you just can't work this way in your spare time on nights and weekends and, and make more value for the company and, and then not see anything, you know, in return. So I think that's why we see some of these kind of like look at Zoom, for example, like, you know, Zoom was created from somebody that left a bigger company and created something that they wanted to see into fruition. Right. So I, I do think there's some underlying concerns here. We can put processes and tools in place all day, but we have to get into, OK, what's in it for people? Why would they? take this risk inside of a bigger company to work this way. And I feel like it's like, that's still a topic we ha we're not speaking enough about. Yeah. Especially, I mean, you mentioned the risk. There is not only the repu reputation risk for the companies, there's, there's also the reputation risk for the person that takes on such an initiative. And Alex, I'm sure you're familiar with that, refers to innovation in most large corporations as career suicide, right? And um, a few a few weeks, months ago, I was talking to Colin Breyer, former chief of staff of uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon. And he says at Amazon, they specifically wanted the best people, someone that like owned 75, 80% of the company's revenue to go and build a completely new business unit. And they, they, they set it out incentive wise, right? So if you manage to make that successful, and I think that could be one of those examples where other large corporations look at because Amazon is not that tiny startup any longer, right? It's, it's, it's juggernaut, but they still manage to have some of their best people also take the risk of being in charge of an, of an innov innovative project. Now, earlier you mentioned two things come to mind. You mentioned incentives. What's the second thing? Well, I think channels. So if you think of more of the positive side of this, as a startup, your, your, your biggest problem usually is attention and lack of attention. Yes. It's not that your idea is good or bad. It's not that you know, you're not willing to test. It, it's usually you just can't find your customers. You can't get enough attention to know whether or not we can, is this going to be a business or is this going to be a hobby? You know, um, with big companies, you do have that working in your advantage if you can leverage those channels. So you have already established channels you can use. And so I do see some companies, um, I went to, I used to run lean startup circles and I used to run the one in, uh, one of the ones in San Francisco and I would travel around. So when I, when I was visiting different cities doing work, I would like stop by at different lean startup circles. Cause I was always curious, you know, how are they ran and what, what kind of cool stuff are they talking about? And I remember specifically going to one in Chicago. It was a lean startup in shock, circle in Chicago a while ago. And they had the VP of innovation for, for Redbox there, which is like these boxes where you get, um, basically you get movies. You go up to a box. It's like a vending machine in a way. You rent a movie and, and you get it out of there. 
they already had channels to test other things, right? So when they want, when they wanted to test video games as a new idea, I was like, could, would people rent video games that way? The, you already have existing channels. You have this existing infrastructure. You can plug in video games. Now, granted, you have to, you know, communicate the value prop of it. You don't just throw it in the machines without telling anybody. But as a startup, it would be, well, <laughs> like, how would I possibly test something? Like, I have to get the funding to put all the machines. And, and like, so uh, I, I do think, uh, and that's just one example, right, of take, taking an existing distribution channel and putting a new idea into that. So I do think I'd love to see more of that. And I'm slowly seeing it with my clients where, we already do something really well. We're making money at that, but we know over time that's going to plateau or, or start to decline. So can we take what we do and, and, and try to imagine it a different way that will make us money? And can we leverage our existing channels to go test those? And I think the only thing holding you back from doing that is who owns those channels and how do they prioritize the work for testing it? Can you get permission to test within those channels? Mm -hmm. And I think as long as you navigate that conversation, then, then that's really working in your advantage. Whereas a, a startup, it's nobody knows who you are. You can't even get the attention to test where in a big company, you have all that attention. It's just, are you taking advantage of it? Yeah. And I think um, the channels is, a, is an excellent example. I, I, I didn't think of that, but the customers just per se, you have the customers as a big corporation with an established business model. By definition, you have customers. So you can much easier, like reach out to them. You have probably your sales channel already existing. And you could you could try all of those new business ideas with with a subset of those customers, if not if not all of them. Now, when we think about this, we talked about some of the risks or challenges that larger organizations face. Now, at the end, we talked about one of the benefits that larger organizations have, or actually two, the channels and the customers. When you are working with organizations and specifically larger organizations with established business models. How do you take them on this overall journey to become better at managing risk? Because testing business ideas, ultimately, as you mentioned, is how do you reduce your risk in a systematic manner? What are the steps that you take? Yeah, I think, I mean, at a high level, is it's more like a three-step process, right? You um, extract your assumptions. So usually I love the desirable, viable, feasible framing for that. Like, do people want this? Should we be working on this? Will it be profitable? And uh, can we do this? And uh, you can also throw in other ones like adaptability and other things, but I, I like sticking with the three to start with. And then uh, map out those assumptions, like what are the riskiest assumptions? So what are the ones that are most important where you have the least amount of evidence? Can the team agree on that with some stakeholder input? And then go test those, go test those assumptions by running experiments. And so if you think of like that three-step process, there are many different on-ramps and ways to navigate that and, and help teams understand how to do that. And I find the teams that get it they love it because they have a list of ideas. They're like, I want to run it through this process and see how we can go find evidence on whether or not we should do this. And, and so at a leadership level, what I'm, what I'm doing more of is, okay, so what are you worried about? Are you more worried about customer demand? Are you worried about nobody paying enough for this? Are you worried about keeping your costs low? Are you worried about your ability to execute? And you can take all those questions and map them back to those themes of desirable, viable, feasible. And so in my head, I'm, I'm always mapping things back to, oh, that's a lot of desirability risk. Here are some things we could do because we have a book that'll help us with that, right? And so usually um, I'm, I'm starting, I'm not starting with giant groups of people. You know, sometimes I run cohorts and things, but I'm really trying to get some traction and, and see people get excited about working this way and, and not wasting their time on building something and not knowing if anybody really wants it and then socializing that inside the company. But for a three-step process, it's extract, map, and then run test. Uh, that that three-step process, I feel like, applies to almost any industry that, I, that I'm working in. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the work that you with leaders. What do you think is the role of those leaders in, in these organizations as part of this extract, map, and test? So, one, it's to not just verbally communicate that this is important, but back it up with action. So we talk about the say do gap all the time in testing business ideas and and and, and uh, value prop design and all that. It's you know your leaders can't have a big say do gap, so it can't be oh I valued you know you all doing this, let's make it work. And then when it comes down to oh we're running into all these problems trying to make it work, them not helping you manage and navigate that. And so they're the ones in the org that have the authority to say uh, oh this process is preventing you from talking to customers. Well, let's take a look at that process. Does it still make sense for what we're trying to do today? You know? So I would say a lot of them is just repeating this message and staying on point and also providing 
actionable help <laughs> in a way because they're the ones that can help remove things, uh, remove barriers that prevent you from working that way or help create an environment where you can work that way. And so uh, I'm seeing a lot of that with some leaders I'm working with now, which is nice. It's a refreshing change to see leaders, you know, really value this. Um, you can certainly help, the leaders can help their direct reports and middle management understand that, you know, if you're starting a new idea, you know, here's some things we can measure or look at in addition to other things we're normally looking at. So look at desirability, viability, feasibility risk. Has the team thought through that risk yet? Uh, what is their plan to address that risk? What are their experiments look like? What have they learned from that? You know, so it's, it's some of it is helping also coach that kind of middle tier of the company that this is work we value. And this is, these are things you're going to be hearing more and more about. And so we're going to get better as a company looking at, oh, here's your list of desirable, viable, feasible, you know, assumptions. And here's your list of experiments. And does this make sense based on where you're at in the journey? Um, is there anything we can help with? Like having something tangible to give feedback on, I think is really important. Um, so I think it's a, it's a combination of staying on point, but also backing up with action. And then also having that layer below them on board, or at least start to understand that this is something that's not just a fad. It's going to be something we value over time and we're going to stick with it and, and really help us de-risk anything new we're working on. Um, so it's, it's a lot I have to say, but I, if I can just find one, I don't see sweet usually, if I can just find one that's very passionate about driving it, then we can make a lot of progress. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. And I love this, um, say do gap because that's exactly what we see in most organizations. They all have these lofty values, but the actions don't back them up. So there's a huge say do gap in, in, in many of this and especially with leaders. Now, what I was wondering while um, you were sharing your insights, your experience with me, David, and at one point I briefly talked about that. Have you ever applied this testing business ideas philosophy, right? You mentioned it being the, the, the scientific principles or principles of scientific method. Um, have you ever applied this to changing an organization? Not building new products, new business ideas, but actually basically changing an auction, organization. Yeah, I've, I've experimented with that a bit. So um, back when I was doing more, a lot more of change management and org transformation work, um, I was also getting more passionate about, you know, early days lean startup stuff and, and really getting into design thinking more. And I realized that a lot of these transformations, whether it be digital transformation or whatever you want to call this transformation that you're going through, um, it is kind of a an experiment in a way, right? Like you can't really project out five years and say, this is exactly how when we change this company, Here's what's going to happen. Um, the best you can do is kind of map it out and then test your way through it. And so I think inherently it's just how I approach my work. And so I would go into these really giant, you know, uh, transformations and I would say, okay, here are the big assumptions we're making in our transformation. Can we start testing and see how the organization responds to us doing different things? Um, because what happens is you might end up creating new problems that arise that might undermine everything, right? And so I think inherently, um, while I can't say I'm an expert in it, I've definitely used that style of work when I'm working through transformations because um, it's kind of ironic that um, I don't want to get on, on a soapbox with agile transformations here, but it's kind of ironic go, that from go, a community, go, go, go. You can do that. <laughs> a community that, that really says we have to inspect and adapt and learn and run in iterations, and then we apply it a giant waterfall process to a transformation. <laughs> it's almost as if like, do we understand? Uh, the dissonance like basically we're taking all these like we're throwing it all aside and saying okay if you're going to transform though here's all the stuff that needs to happen and here's your plan and you just execute on that plan it's like that's not like do you not see the the yeah. irony here so i i much view it as an iterative thing I, I think it's a harder sell because then people are saying well what do i get out of this you know um but I think you can be very thoughtful about it include a leadership team so when i do it i kind of have a cross-functional leadership team and we map out what the transformation could look like uh, just just a visually, right? Kind of like that goals, capability, tasks point of view. And then we go through running experiments and managing that work and seeing coming back and updating that artifact, right? So I take a very iterative approach to it, but it just it's just, I find it odd that we take the giant waterfall approach to transformations, even something that would help a company be more iterative and agile. I think it's very ironic. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, and I think it goes even beyond being ironic. I find it very sad. And um, because, I mean, 
when, when I work with organizations, be it teams, be it senior leaders, one of the first things that I share with them is the Stacy matrix. And I'm sure you've seen this, right? Simple, complicated, complex, and chaos. And we talk about each of those things, and it's all based on the level of uncertainty that you're facing in terms of what to build, right, and how to build it. Now, at the end of these kinds of sessions, I ask them, where would you plot an organizational change initiative? Be it a digital transformation. They're like, oh, it goes into chaos because we don't know what the organization is going to look like. And we don't know other than a high level, right? We don't know how we're going to get there. Like what are exactly the different steps that we're going to take? And then I asked them, now, earlier we talked that complex and chaos, you need to apply empirical process control, which is basically the scientific principles or the scientific method. So what should we apply when we're changing the organization? They're like, easy, scientific method. So when you walk people through that, everybody that I have met so far and I've trained more than 10,000 people in the past decade, they all get to that same conclusion. But I agree with you, the vast majority of that actual community is trying to sell transformation as a big waterfall project where everything is clear, which is not. So it's a bit more than ironic. It, it is sad. And I, and I like the fact because while you were speaking, I was like, yeah, it would absolutely make sense to apply this extract, map, and test of assumptions, right? The three-step approach also to changing an organization. And now when we dive into this, you gave us already a pretty good overview. What are some of the experiments that you have run as part of organizational change initiatives? Oh, I mean, uh, I mean, there's some I can talk about, but I think like uh, take, take, um, take like compensation and individual like incentives in, into the equation, mm -hmm. right? So for example, you're trying to move into from project-based tasks that people have farmed out the tasks to, and they're part of a project team and it's functionally siloed. And then they, they're basically individually incentivized to do well at a task level and then say, okay, now we're going to do cross-functional teams, right? So we're going to have a, a team around a goal and you're going to be incentivized as a team, right? So how would you test your way through that, right? you probably wouldn't reorg the whole company into cross-functional teams and come up with the next best incentive plan and career, uh, you know, career performance Correction. review <laughs> like mm -hmm. process and just roll it out across the company. Right. So what we do instead is we would take like, let's say what part of the company is working on something new that is, has a high degree of uncertainty. How would we incentivize a team? to assemble around that idea and how we incentivize them to, um, to basically work on that idea. Right. So I would start at a small level and, and not take this approach where, okay, let's neck, let's design the next best perfect process and just roll it out across the company, you know? So that's kind of how I approach it is we take, you know, something where it'd be a good starting area and go test a change there. So, um, and I learned a lot of that from, you know, uh, well, back in the day when I worked at Big Visible, we were doing a lot of org transformation work. And then um, back when I met Eric Rees was kind of back when I was working there. And I, I was taking a lot of his approaches when he's, when Eric would say something like, well, you all are really smart people. And if you understood this problem, you probably would have solved it by now, you know? So I don't think we understand the problem deep enough. So how do we do discovery on the problem and apply scientific method there? And so there are usually pockets of that inside your org, right? There are places where it's like, man, we've been trying to solve this problem forever and, and we just can't solve it. And then they've never really backed up and say, do we really understand that problem well enough? <laughs> like we've thrown all the solutions at it. And so I try to find those opportunities to say, can we work a different way inside an org and those opportunities and test it out and then share our results and get people excited by that. And, and usually what happens is people go, well, how did you finally solve that? And it's like, oh, we just ended up working a different way. And then you back your way into what are the tools and processes and techniques you use to solve it there, right? So I tend to take a more, again, small focused approach where we find an area of the company where it's something that well, clearly what we're doing now isn't working. Can we try working a different way and organizing around that a different way and then measuring the results and then socializing that and getting people excited by that? And so that's my approach. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I, I tend to take that approach because I think it's more about momentum 
And so building like momentum inside of a company is a very amazing thing because you go from a push to a pull. It goes from, oh, I feel like I'm just like for the last year, I've just been pushing this giant boulder up a hill, trying to get people to care about this way of working and everything. And then th the switch happens where it becomes more of a pull where you have parts of the org you haven't even heard of reach out and go, hey, can you help us with this problem we're working on? Or I heard this thing about this other, like I've worked with copywriting groups inside companies and content creation groups. So I was like, I didn't really plan on working with these groups, but they heard about how we were helping other parts and they thought, hmm, we're dealing with this kind of a similar problem over here. Can you help us with that? So you reach this inflection point where it goes from a push to a pull. And I don't know, I'm sure you've experienced that. Yeah. It's, 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 it's like, oh, wow, this is finally like hopefully going to sustain now. And I think it's just such a, if you have the resilience to keep at it, um, I find that, 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 that inflection point where it goes from a push to a pull is just really, you know, really satisfying. And I mean, you have that inflection point from push to pull also in product development. So after all, like organizational design or organizational development and product development are not that different. And I really love the example that you gave, like a small experiment on compensation for just this one team and not immediately, again, the waterfall approach, thinking about the whole organization and what could go wrong. No, this small team. And honestly, we're going to learn something. And it doesn't mean that if it works for this small team, that it's going to work for all of the organization. We might have to apply a mindset where we have this works here, this works there, this works there, different tools for different contexts. That's also part of understanding or dealing with the uncertainty and the complexity that that all organizations are facing today. Now, David, I'm looking at the time. We're almost at the very end of our time box. Two things. First of all, thank you so much for taking the time at 8.30 your time, showing up, running this session with me and sharing your insights, which is, I could go on for hours. I don't know how the time passed. Second thing, where can people learn more? Obviously, one is the book that you have behind you, Testing Business Ideas, but where else can people learn from you? Yeah, I mean, you can find me on online anyway at davidjbland.com. That's usually the best way to find me uh, as far as like what I do and a good some videos and things about what I'm doing. We have some stuff on the book on there. For social media, I have to say I'm probably more active on LinkedIn than anything else anymore. And uh, if you follow me there, just be prepared for, you know, memes and humor. And, and I'm trying to educate people, but I'm trying to make you laugh. So I don't really take this really dry, like, oh, geez, I feel like some of the content on LinkedIn, it's just so painful to read, you know. And so I'm really trying to inject a lot of humor into it and, and just educate people. So um, just be prepared. If you follow me there, it's going not going to be run of the mill like business advice. It's going to be a, a wild ride. So, yeah, LinkedIn or, or my website is usually the best way. Cool. David, thank you so much again for being on this show. Thanks for having me.